nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Thank you very, very much. Uh, this is our guest. This is, this is our uh, last please uh, for this year. Uh, so thanks to our, uh, we've got some uh, some uh, frequent flyers here. Thanks to you, but especially thanks to well, as well as those who are coming for the first time. Um, uh, this spring we asked, uh, uh, and I hope we didn't lean too hard, on some of our 150th anniversary professors, those professors who were honored by their colleagues. Uh, Dr. Carlson has a great memory. She remembers from years ago that uh, in the six months I had to get ready to uh, come to this job, I tried to do everything I could that uh, might prepare me a little bit. She remembers correctly, I ordered a course in quantum mechanics from books on the, I mean, so courses. Uh, Great courses, um, and um, it didn't do much good. <laughs> but I memorized at least some of the uh, of the vocabulary. Well, it turns out that our Dr. Carlson will soon be featured in great courses, doing a, a, a course a similar course, which is terrific. Uh, and actually. Uh, I'm glad you told that story because I actually brought a copy <laughs> for you. It's, it's got your name on it, so there, there's the new copy. So the updated course on quantum mechanics is now done by a boiler maker, Boiler Up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Did you even talk them into the colors on the course? You know, that was uh, they have their own graphic designers, and they 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 did their job very well without my help. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, I, I can't wait. I've got a fighting chance this time because as she was explaining to me, she said one of her great mentors earlier told her that if you can't explain physics to an eight-year-old, you probably don't understand it yourself. <laughs> Erica put it somewhat differently. She said she's been looking forward to this because she likes to think she can even explain this to an English professor. So, <laughs> so those of you who... <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> we, we are really looking forward to it. Thank you, Dr. Carlson, very much for, of course, all the distinction you bring to Purdue, but also for the, with the whatever you have to tell us today. All right. Thanks. Yeah, and thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, no, really, if you if you are here from a field that is not science, you are my target audience today. Okay, so this talk is for you. I wrote it with you in mind. So uh, so I hope you understand it, and uh, you know you can stop me if you have questions as as we go along. Um, I I do enjoy physics very much, and I think it's such a fun field that it is worth sharing with the world. So I'm glad you're here. Um, I want to recognize some of my uh, collaborators. Uh, Karen Daman is my main theory collaborator. She's a professor at University of Illinois. The others you see listed on the theory side have been my PhD students, and uh, uh, two of them already have PhDs and are out in the world, and, and another is still working on his PhD. Uh, we have several experimental collaborators. I will only tell you about work today that's done in collaboration with the group at Columbia, but we have uh, several different groups that we work with on these things from around the world, which is quite a, a privilege as well. Um, so it's always good to start a talk with a cat, yes? All right. Um, so let me first tell you a little bit about fractals and what fractals mean and uh, why we get excited about fractals. Uh, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what quantum materials are and why we're excited about those. And then I'll show you how there's been a fusion of those in the past few years. So this you may recognize as a cat. Now, most objects, when you zoom in on them, okay, so you, you either get your eyeballs closer to them or you use a microscope or something like that and you zoom in, most objects, when you zoom in, they look quite different. This looks like a cat, and if I only showed you the, the picture of the zoom in on the fur, you might have had trouble identifying it as a cat. Now, things that are um, scale invariant are fractal in nature. So a fractal is some mathematical object or physical object such that when you zoom in on it, it looks the same. This is a famous uh, fractal called a Sierpinski carpet, Sierpinski triangle in this case. The way you make it is by making one big triangle, then you inscribe a triangle inside of it and delete that. And then you go back to what you have left, you inscribe a triangle in that, what's left, and delete it. And then you go back and inscribe triangles in what's left and delete it. And it's recursive. And so because it's the same recursive step over and over, it's about three or four lines of code to do. And you can make a computer put, put this out for you. It means, though, that if we zoomed in on it, it would look the same 
at, at, you know, every time we zoom in, it's just going to look the same and the same and the same, very much unlike a cat. Um, now, there are uh, actually, you know, lots of, of fractals in nature. If you think about how they can arise, this is a great day to be looking out the window. So if you get bored during the talk, it will not offend me if you look at the beauty of nature out there because it's full of fractals, okay? So if you look out, you see all these trees. Well, the tree structures, they branch, and then they branch, and then they branch, and then they branch. That's an example of something that is fractal in nature because I can zoom in from the trunk to a major branch, to a split of that branch, to a split of those branches, and there's a fractal structure as you go along that, that chain. So these are examples of, of fractals. Okay, here's an example of a Mandelbrot fra fractal. Uh, Benoit Ma Mandelbrot is a mathematician who developed the, the original mathematics explaining this. This is an example of what's called a Mandelbrot set. The fun thing here is that if the video works, we're going to see what it's like to actually zoom in on a fractal, okay? Um, okay, let's see. We, we're zooming in, we're zooming in, and what I want you to notice is that it basically looks the same. We're just continuing to zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, and at every length scale, it looks the same until we decide we're, we're we're good, we got the concept, okay? But a fractal is like that. You could look at it from a large distance and there's a structure to it, and you look at it from a tiny distance and it's the same structure. And you go in and go in and go in and it's the same structure all the way down. That's a, a fractal structure. We call that scale invariant, meaning it doesn't depend on the scale at which you look at it. There's a self-similarity among the different scales. Does that, does that make sense, all right? Okay. Um, so uh, there are some numbers then that we can associate with the geometry of these fractals. So let me tell you about a couple of these types of numbers. You already saw the Sierpinski triangle, okay? And the interesting thing there is that the interior of the object is fractal in nature, okay? Um, here's a different type of fractal that one can make, which is called a Koch snowflake. It's, it's also based off of triangles and recursion, but uh, but it's about the lines rather than the interior. Here, we started with a, a big triangle and deleted the interior and then deleted some of the interior that was left. Here, we're going to work with the edges, okay? So here we have a triangle, and then on each leg of the triangle, you uh, insert another triangle along that middle line, and then you do it again. Insert more triangles along those lines and insert more triangles, and again, you just you can do that recursively, iteratively, again and again and again, and you eventually get what's called the Koch snowflake. And if you were to zoom in on that edge, it would always look the same, just like that, that movie that I just played about the scale invariance. Now, there are two very different types of fractals. One is about the interior having a fractal structure. The other is about the boundary having a fractal structure, okay? This one, by the way, is related to the question, there's a, there's a famous question that, that uh, Mandelbrot likes to, pro, uh, to pose, which is, how long is the coastline of Britain? And his point is, it depends on what link scale you measure, because as you get to finer and finer link scales, you'll find more nooks and crannies, okay? And so this is that type of fractal, where the edge is no longer an object that's a line, right? A line has one dimension, this, this has not quite two dimensions, it's somewhere in between. So we call that a fractional dimension, it's not one dimension. One dimension would be something where I can address it by going front to back, for example, only. Um, this has wiggles in it. This also has a fractal dimension associated with the interior, but they're, they're conceptually different. The interior of the Koch snowflake is not fractal, it's solid, okay? Whereas here, the interior of the Sierpinski triangle is fractal, but its edge is not fractal, it's a straight line. So the interior fractal dimension and the hull fractal dimension are conceptually different. This one is a little bit more like Swiss cheese, right? Swiss cheese, this isn't a fractal Swiss cheese, although we could make it that way, right, by deleting um, smaller and smaller holes. Um, but the edge is straight, assuming you got a slice of it, right? I like to show this guy, because again, it's good to show cats and geckos, right? Um, uh, I love geckos. Have you guys seen them walk around? On, they can crawl up anything, they can walk across the ceiling, and the way they do it is actually by fractals. Uh, fractals appear in a lot of places in nature. So where's the fractal in a gecko? It's on its feet. Its feet would be the magical sticky part, right? And on the feet, this is a, a zoom in of what the hairs look like. There are very fine hairs there on the feet of the gecko. 
And the hairs, talk about split ends. You think you have split end issues. The gecko has split ends like crazy. So these, these hairs split and split and split and split and split until they become very, very fine at the ends. And it's that very fineness, the very fractal nature at the very tips that allows it when it's making contact with any surface, those hairs can get so close that they, they automatically stick by what's called Van der Waals forces. You can ask me or a chemist, your favorite chemist, you know, later afterwards, I'll tell you what it is. But the key is to get them very, very close to each other. And that's how they, that's how it, it's attracted to things. So, so fractals come up in a lot of different cases. But what I want you to see is there's basically two numbers we can associate with them. One is going to be what I'll call the volume fractal dimension. It's whether or not the interior is Swiss cheesy. And the other, I'm going to call the hull fractal dimension, meaning the boundary of it is the boundary fractal. And they're distinct numbers, OK? Um, do you have any questions so far? All right. OK, now let me give you a little bit of introduction, very brief introduction to quantum materials. Um, that's my research field. I work on, on quantum materials. Uh, and then after that, I'll show you how the two have come uh, crashing into each other's worlds. So. Um, there are conventional materials that we can understand and describe without using much quantum mechanics, OK? Um, semiconductors would be an example where once we get to a certain point in the problem, we don't need the quantum anymore. And so at some point, the problem we can reduce essentially to pretending that the electrons inside of a semiconductor, and it's the electrons that do the work for you in, in materials that you use technologically. It's the electrons you have to track. Those are the things that are running around, carrying the current, um, being the memory elements, things like that. So, you know, your, your computer's semiconductors, it's working by, it's moving electrons around. Believe it or not, inside of semiconductors, we can pretend that the electrons are like little tiny balls. They probably don't quite look like that. I always imagine them as blue. I don't know why. But, um, but essentially, they act like little balls that get thrown from one spot to another. And that's not very quantum, okay? It's very much just like a ball that you can hold in your hand. Um, so in a quantum material, we're going to be concerned with the fact that we, we need the quantum mechanics the whole way to describe the electronic behavior of quantum materials. We don't get to drop the quantum and pretend and make some sort of non-quantum approximation at some point as we do in semiconductors. Um, I mean, ultimately, quantum mechanics underlies semiconductors too. But with quantum materials, the quantum properties will remain at the forefront. And so even when we're describing how we would technologically control the materials, or use them and apply them, um, we still need all of the quantum properties. Some of the quantum properties we care about in those instances are the electron spin. Um, uh, electron spin is wonderfully quantum. It, we, we don't have an analog in, um, that, that I can uh, easily show you, but I, if you can imagine with me, I can tell you a little bit about what, what electron, what quantum spin is like. You can imagine if I had a real basketball and I were skilled, I could spin it on my finger, right? A basketball spinning can spin along any direction I want. I could have that thing spinning this way, or I could have it spinning this way, or spinning this way, or spinning that way. And it could spin as fast or as slow as I want it, OK? And a very skilled person with a basketball can make it do any of those things. When we measure electrons, it turns out they're spinning too. They're always spinning. They never stop. And they're always spinning at the same speed. <laughs> and they're only ever spinning along the direction we check. So when we check, are you spinning along this axis? It says yes, and it gives us back clockwise or counterclockwise at the same speed. We say, well, OK, fine. Are you spinning along this axis? And it says yes. <laughs> the only question left is clockwise or counterclockwise. Are you spinning along this axis? Yes. Cl it's just clockwise or counterclockwise. It's very weird. And so when things become uh, countable in whole numbers like that, we say it's quantized. Because the answer it gives back to us when it's an electron spinning is that it's either clockwise or counterclockwise. There's only two options there. That's quantized in the sense of countable. So that's an example of quantum behavior. Uh, the electron spin is a strange quantum object. Oftentimes we find that when we go to try to harness or uh, manipulate objects uh, that are quantum in nature, we find that they're very ethereal. So for example, the wave nature really plays in. Um, I think this is, yeah, there we go, OK. So this is um, a simulation of uh, the wave shape that an electron can take in an atom. Around an atom, electrons are, are 
are, they're partly particles and partly waves. We call it wave-particle duality. But when you're thinking about how the electron behaves around an atom, it, it's, I think it's much more helpful to look in the wave picture and stay in the wave picture for that. And it turns out that the wave takes these lovely, beautiful three-dimensional standing wave shapes. And so it's kind of resonating there, just like maybe a drum head, only it's got an extra dimension to it. And so it makes these beautiful patterns, all right? But it's ethereal. It's kind of wiggling around and squiggling and things like that. There's motion to it all the time because it's a wave and waves wave. Um, and so the electron wave shapes uh, uh, are very important in, in these materials. And because there's a wave nature and waves can interfere, then, um, then we care about those quantum effects as well. And there are other quantum effects we could talk about. You're welcome to ask me later. But these, these are the things that make something that we would call a quantum material a quantum material. These types of properties are going to stay at the forefront. They're not going to be something we can sweep under the rug and pretend they're not there. That makes it a quantum material. Do you have any questions so far? Oh, yes. Why did you choose those colors? Oh, you know what? This is actually a program written by my friend Dean Dowger. We were graduate students together at UCLA. And, um, and so and then he formed a company, Dowger Research. And so this is uh, how he chose to color it. I, I like that the coloration actually has physical meaning, which is that he's chosen to represent the phase of the wave with color. Just to tell you what phase of a wave is, if you imagine a wave going by, when it's high, it's got one phase. When it's low, it's got the opposite phase. And so what he's done here is he's colored for you the highs and the lows. All right, And they're always in opposition to each other. So that's why he put them on opposite sides of the color wheel. So I, I, I like how he did the visualization. It just made me think of the black hole picture last week. Oh, no relation. No relation, <laughs> yeah. I, I also am a big fan of the black hole picture from last week. But uh, no relation, yeah. Yeah, any other questions so far? Yes? So when you talk about the electron spin, and the way it spins in all directions, no matter what you're asking it. Right. You're asking it's it, weird. and you're focused on it. Yeah. Is it responding to your focus? Oh, excellent question. Can I ask what's your department? Uh, nursing. And do you know quantum already? I because, into some okay, ideas. it's a brilliant question. And this is exactly what people struggled with in trying to figure out what was going on. There's, you, you just articulated a, a f what, what we call observer determines reality. Right. And um, you're welcome to ask me more about that afterwards. Right. Um, it's, it's a technical phrase that, that sounds a little different in colloquial English from how we, we use it. But it does mean that our experimental setup does matter. And so the particle does respond to our experimental setup. It doesn't respond to the consciousness of the observer. We don't, we don't mean it in that sense. Any piece of equipment will do, whether I'm present or not. Um, but yeah, it does mean that the experimental setup absolutely affects what's going on. So, so like I said, they're a little bit ethereal and hard to pin down, and we go to measure them, and it's like they move away. Here's, here's a good analogy for that. Um, have you ever had this happen to you where like you crack an egg, and you get a little bit of eggshell in the bowl, and then you have to go fishing around to get that eggshell out? You know that feeling of like, it's right there, but I can't get it? <laughs> Quantum. Okay, I'm not saying the eggshell. <laughs> I'm not saying the eggshell's quantum, but we have those kind of experiences when we try to trap these things and manipulate them. Uh, the very fact that we've trapped them and we try to manipulate them makes them move, just like you just said. Yeah. Yeah. Then the other thought I had too, just because I just have to go there. But when you talk about fractals, and I think about the universe, and then yeah. you talk about the Earth, and are we all just one big fractal of something else? Wow, okay, I hope I have, do I have a cosmology friend in the room? Okay, so we, we find structure, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right, we find structure on lots of link scales in, in the universe, and in fact, um, the, <laughs> uh, Sorry, yes, no, in the, in the dense, in the large scale density structure of the universe, people find exactly these kind of fractal structures. So they seem to have, they seem to have started very early on in the history of the universe. Yes, yes, excellent, excellent question, although I won't be talking about those fractals, but they, they come up in lots of places in nature. They don't come up everywhere, but they come up in a surprising number of places, yeah. Other questions so far? Oh, yeah, please. With the electron wave shapes, what's the discrete question there? So for the spin medium, yeah. counterclockwise, what's the question for the wave shapes? Um, you mean what makes it quantized? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so um, what's your what's your field? 
Okay, great. So, you, so, so, and if you've taken a chemistry class, um, then they taught you about the the or chemistry orbitals of an of, of a, those. Those are about the wave shape that the electron takes around an atom, and so the one s state, the two s state, the two p state. 3D and so on, those can all be traced back to uh, three-dimensional standing wave shapes. So in fact, I'm now regretting that I didn't bring a slinky because I could I could show you this on a slinky. Um, so if you imagine a slinky, you can get quantized behavior out of waves. It's a bit of a crazy thing. How do you get quantum countable and whole numbers out of waves? The way you do it is by confining their geometry. And then you get quantized waves. So if I take, for example, a slinky and I rotate it, I'd get one wave, but then I could put a, a second mode on there and it would have a different shape. And if you're skilled, you can put a third mode on. Uh, and if you're familiar with drums, you just sort of now add another dimension and think of a drum head. And the drum head will have a mode that goes up and down and it'll have a mode that goes like this. The mode is what's countable. And and then if you can imagine adding a third dimension, that's actually what this visualization is doing. It's showing you a three-dimensional standing wave shape that the electron takes around the nucleus. And those shapes are distinct enough that they're countable. And that's where the quantization comes from for the shapes. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. OK, so these things are going to matter in quantum materials. Let me show you now some data on quantum materials. Uh, and. Um, the, these are lots of different uh, materials. I don't want to tell you that this happens in every quantum material, nor does it happen all the time. It's happening at special places that data is showing us that there's a lot of interesting pattern formation that can be measured at the surface of these materials. It's very difficult to measure the interior of a surface, although experiments are always pushing the envelope, and I think that's coming. Um, my colleague in physics, Steve Durbin, is working on pushing that forward with x-rays. Um, but these are various different ways that we have of measuring the electronic properties at the surface of a material. Um, and so uh, to tell you what, what's the physics going on, this material, vanadium dioxide, is a metal insulator transition material. Uh, there's a specific temperature right around 340 Kelvin, where it suddenly changes from a really good insulator that will not carry current to a really good metal that carries current very well. The place you see metals used, uh, any electrical wire, like this electrical wire here is, has copper in it. And th the nice thing about metals is that the electrons flow through that material. That's how we move the electricity around. The electrons are actually liquid-like. So to have a material suddenly go from metal to insulator is pretty exciting. And one of the things people really like about this and this, this is neodymium nicolate. Um, and uh, it also undergoes a metal insulator transition. Um, these fields of view, by the way, this is about four microns across. This is about 40 microns across. Different materials, different fields of view. Um, what they're actually measuring here, it's, it's a false color image. But to briefly tell you what they're roughly measuring, they do what's called light scattering off of it and then measure the resulting image. If you wanted to identify the metals in the room, you don't actually have to do a complicated experiment, right? You can usually spot the metals by eye, right? What's, what's the visual cue that some material is a metal? Shiny. It's exactly what they're looking for here. So they shine light on it, and then the shiny parts, they color blue. <laughs> That's exactly what this experiment is. Okay, so those are the metal pieces. And then the other uh, colors are the insulating uh, piece. And what was surprising, what people did not know until these very detailed pictures were taken, um, is that it's actually got a lot of structure in the pattern formation. Uh, it would have, would have been sort of easier to, ma to imagine that I lower the temperature on this material and all of a sudden it, boom, becomes a metal. And I raise the temperature again and, all, and it all of a sudden, boom, becomes an insulator. But this is showing you that it, it does it in a very patterned way, which is very interesting. So that's why we got interested in it. And uh, this is uh, data out of Dmitry Bazov's group at, at uh, University of Columbia. And, um, We've been very interested in, in helping them understand the, the origin of these patterns. I'm going to tell you that I think these are fractals. And I'll show you some of the analysis we did that, that shows that they're fractals. It comes up in other materials with other things that people measure. Um, this is another metal insulator material. These are cuprate superconductors. I like superconductors a lot. And 
it's a different type of probe. It's scanning tunneling microscopy. And what it's showing you is that electrons line up in little channels spontaneously. These channels have nothing to do with the chemical structure. The chemical structure is much smaller than this. So the electrons are spontaneously making these little train tracks. But the train track orientations switch direction. And when you look at a much larger field of view, which is this, where now we've colored it so that uh, the blue and red means something totally different in this material. This is red is train tracks going diagonal to the left. Blue is train tracks going diagonal to the right. There's this two component structure there that we've false colored for you. And there's also a fractal hiding in there. Um, that takes a lot of data analysis to show that it's a fractal, but we, we've done that. And here's another um, material that also shows two component behavior of a completely different kind. All right, uh, you're welcome to ask me later exactly what that is, but it's also showing a fractal structure. And um, so this was very interesting to us to see in the data sets because fractals occur at certain phase transitions. So I bet you've all heard of phase transitions. <laughs> so you know that a phase transition is it's a phase change from one state of matter to another. Um, but you may not have known that uh, fractals actually occur at certain uh, phase transitions. Please. So, so these are surface images, so are people not using tomography for? Well, it's a, it depends on the type of probe that you have. It's actually very difficult to see into the interior of a material and catch the electrons. Yeah, that's what I wondered. That's, that's the issue. So we can do, you know, all sorts of scattering experiments where we shoot things through the material. Most of the times you're, you're catching the, um, the atoms and, and then to go back and go slice by slice to get that structure is actually difficult. But people are working on doing it in the interior. Most of the data is at the surfaces right now. They're, they're, they're being developed. And do you expect to see a lot of things? Um, yes, actually. I expect to see that these fractals, when they happen, d depending on the material, okay, um, I expect to see that sometimes these fractals go straight through the, the bulk. And actually, we've, we've developed uh, theoretical ways to, to tell just from the surface whether that fractal is actually all the way inside as well. We're very excited about that. Um, and the way we do that is basically, um, you, you know, you, you look out this window and you have a two-dimensional view of the trees, but you can tell just by the structure of the trees that they're filling space. You're not fooled into thinking that those fractals are growing on the window, right? And so we have ways to connect back to the fractal numbers and let an experimentalist know from their own, sorry, from their own data set, um, whether these fractals, um, are uh, just on the surface, like frost growing on the window, or whether they're in the bulk like a tree. And so we're actually very excited about that, and that's, that's part of why we got such a long list of experimental collaborators that are interested in talking to us about it. So let me tell you a little bit about, oh, uh, question from a physicist. Okay, sure. Can you comment on the lens scales on the scale? Because I think the scale bar that have Well, it's different for different modalities, right? So here you've got four microns, here you've got 40 microns. The STMs are all going to be 50 nanometer images. Uh, this one, I forget. This one is about a 30 nanometer image. Yeah. So, um, yep. And their different probes have different length scales they can operate at. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Okay. So you've heard of phase transitions, right? Maybe you've heard of solid liquid gas and you're familiar with those phase transitions. Uh, this is a great, uh, Artistic picture of, of three phases of water as a solid, as a liquid, or here as a, as a gas. Now, um, my field of physics, we study phases of matter and phase transitions, and you might think it's all done, but there's many, many more phases of matter than solid, liquid, gas. Does anyone here have a liquid crystal display somewhere? Okay, all the iPhones and laptops are liquid crystal displays. Liquid crystals are neither liquid nor crystal. They're actually liquid in one direction and crystalline in another, and it's a distinct phase of matter. There's a distinct phase transition between something that's a liquid crystal and something that's actually a, a fluid or a crystal. Um, superfluids and Bose-Einstein condensates are, are other phases of matter that we can have. These are uh, explicitly uh, quantum phases of matter. Um, so there's are lots of different phase transitions that atoms can do and molecules can do. Um, now, I specifically study what electrons do inside of materials. And when you get to electrons, 
Electrons have their own phases of matter and phase transitions. And the thing I want to impress upon you here is that there's more stuff on the slide, okay? So when I get to how do electrons behave, not only do they have their own phases of matter and phase transitions, but there are many, many more of them, which is, which is why we're still in business. There's actually an infinite number. So that might be surprising to hear that there are phase transitions that electrons have inside of a material. Metals act very differently electronically from semiconductors, okay? And they act very differently from magnets. Um, I've listed a lot of different types of magnetism here, but think of, you know, a refrigerator magnet, right? That's a ferromagnet, we call it. And if you were to take that magnet and heat it up, now you gotta heat it up pretty high, but if you were to take that magnet and heat it up, eventually the magnetism will go away. And there's a well-defined temperature at which the magnetism will disappear. Now, if you heat the material up enough, it will melt, okay? But way before it melts and turns into slush, while it's still a solid, that magnet would then lose its magnetization. And if you lowered the temperature again, all of a sudden, the magnetization would come back. That's a phase transition, because as I cross that temperature, there's vastly different behavior, right? But And it's the difference between whether that magnet holds onto the refrigerator or falls off, right? So that's a that's an example of an electronic phase transition. And each of these things that I'm showing are, dis are distinct enough that there are phase transitions between them. A metal is not an insulator, and there's a phase transition between them. Um, there are superconductors. Superconductors are when a material carries current perfectly with no loss of energy. Metals always lose energy. Superconductors don't. Uh, there's a phase transition between them. Quantum Hall phases, I'll just leave in their box. I don't have time to explain them, but there's an infinite number of them. Uh, and I've worked a lot on elect electronic liquid crystals. I showed you this before, where you have the electrons going in little train tracks. It turns out they're liquid-like inside the lines. And so it's actually a liquid crystal. It's liquid in this direction, but it's not liquid in the other direction where it's confined. And so we call that an electronic uh, liquid crystal. And I'm sure it's going to advance any second now. Yes? What is the distance scale in the lower right hand? In the lower right hand, uh, 50 nanometers. And, oh, the distance between the train tracks is about 16 angstroms. If you want to know the unit cell of the, the, the um, structure underneath, the distance from one atomic cell to the next is about 4 angstroms. So these structures are 16 angstroms wide. The electrons are doing something quite independent of the atoms in which they're residing. Okay, so there's actually two different types of phase transitions in the world. Um, so you, you are mostly familiar with the first category. Sometimes they're called first order phase transitions, uh, mainly because they were discovered first. Um, and, uh, but we now, the modern language is a discontinuous phase transition. And then there's a second category, which is the kind that produces fractals, which I'll, I'll tell you about. But let me first remind you what happens in the kind of phase transitions that you're used to. So you're used to, for example, ice melting or water boiling. Those are both uh, first order phase transitions. And some of the characteristics is that they occur suddenly uh, when the, you know, you know whether the water's boiling or not. Um, and examples are freezing uh, and melting or, or boiling. Um, there's a discontinuous change in properties. You never look at a glass of ice water and wonder which part's the liquid, which part's the ice. It's always very clear to you. This part's the liquid, I can drink it. This part's the ice, I'm gonna have to wait for it to melt or crunch it, something like that. So that's, that's a property of a, of a first order phase transition. So here's a nice, um, demonstration you can do yourself. Uh, take bottled water, doesn't matter what kind, as long as you don't open it yet. Put it in the freezer for a few hours and you can super cool it. Notice how it's liquid in the bottle, but when it's poured out, it becomes solid. That's, what has happened here is that these first order phase transitions have a very interesting property in that you can actually miss the transition. You can super cool water in the sense if you cool the water down, it should be ice, but it's like the water doesn't know it yet. And it's not until you give it a little bit of a kick that it realizes, oh, I should be solid now. So that's called super cooling. And again, you can do it yourself. The, the way I do it is I take a couple of bottles of water and put them in the freezer. And I do that maybe every hour and a half for about, you know, maybe six or seven hours and then go back and pull some out. You'll find some of them will be in the sweet spot where you have super cooled bottles and it might look like you pull it out and it looks liquid and then you shake it and it freezes. Okay. I like doing that in our thermodynamics classes. It's, it's really fun. 
So you can, you can try that one at home. But that's a characteristic of a first order phase transition. There's a really sharp change between liquid and solid. Now, I promised you a second category of phase transition, which is what gives rise to the fractal behavior at those phase transitions. Uh, continuous phase transitions you don't have direct experience with, but I'll show you uh, an example of it. Um, continuous phase transitions occur gradually. So, for example, if we think back to that magnet, if you take your refrigerator magnet and you heat it up, and you're going to have the magnetization disappear, the magnetization will actually disappear slowly. It'll slowly, slowly, slowly go to zero until there's one temperature at which it's gone. All right, so there's a definite temperature at which it goes away, but it does it in a continuous manner. That's why we call it a continuous phase transition. And these types of phase transitions actually have fractal behavior that pops up. So this is best seen in a video. So this is an example of a second order phase transition that's coming. This is a test tube that's got two liquids mixed together at high temperature. And when they lower the temperature, right now they're lowering the temperature, as they lower the temperature, the two liquids will separate out like oil and water, all right? But as they do it, you'll start to see the continuous nature of the transition. Can you see these little white tendrils coming in like clouds? And notice how the white tendrils are jumping and jumping and jumping. This is the second order nature of it that you're starting to see. And eventually the white starts jumping across the entire test tube. And now it's white all over. This point is called critical opalescence. What's going on here is that right at that transition point, it's a continuous phase transition, and the density of the liquid went fractal. <laughs> Meaning there are fluctuations of the density. Density would be how many how many of the molecules are in any volume I look in, okay? So the structure of the density went fractal, um, meaning there are fluctuations that go all the way across the test tube. You saw those when you saw the tendril go all the way across, and then there are fluctuations at shorter scales and shorter scales and shorter scales. And when it turns white, it did so because it's scattering light of all frequencies in the visible range because it has structures inside of it that match all those wavelengths of light. So, so the white is the, is the key there to telling you that in fact the density is fractal. And if we were to zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, we'd see that it looks the same. As they're lowering the temperature more, you start to see the heavier liquid occur at the bottom. But from this point all the way up to this point, you've got what's called critical fluctuations. And, and the density is fractal in nature in there. That's what the white is, is showing you. Um, so this is pretty cool. I can't think of any phase transition you can do at home that does this, except perhaps to try unmixing uh, two, two liquids <laughs> like, like that. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's fractal inside, which is, uh, which is the, the excitement of that. Now, um, so here's uh, a snapshot from where it was right at the point when it started to show you its fractal behavior. There's a fluctuation that went all the way through, and all along the white bits, you've got fractal density inside. And this is covering a lot of scales, right? This is all the way from the size of the test tube, probably about five centimeters, all the way down to the spacing between the molecules. It's got this fractal structure to it. So if we zoomed in and zoomed in and zoomed in, it would be like that movie I showed at the beginning of, oh, I'm seeing structure, oh, I'm seeing the same structure, and so forth. So it's got that self-similar behavior to it. And that's one of the um, characteristics of a second order phase transition. So, so that was all to convince you, or to at least tell you, that fractals happen at certain uh, phase transitions, they happen at continuous phase transitions. So when we saw these data sets, and actually, actually this one was the first to come out that shows that showed this behavior. Um, this, uh, we when we saw that behavior, we thought, man, that looks fractal. I wonder if that's really going on. And if it is, it would be evidence that you're near one of these second order phase transitions. And the neat thing is that once, once you see that connection, that there are fractal numbers there, and that you can then use fractal mathematics to characterize uh, those patterns, then we can compare those fractal numbers seen in experiment to the fractal numbers that come out of theories of how those patterns form. And so that's the excitement for us, is that just based on the shapes, the geometry that's in here, we can tell you why those patterns happened. And that's uh, part of what we're, what we're so excited about. Um, okay, so this would be uh, focusing in on one of those materials. This is vanadium dioxide. It's a metal insulator transition material that I mentioned to you before. And um, in, in this 
color image, blue is insulating and green and red are metallic. Those are the shiny parts. And as it's going through its transition, this is on warming, so warming from 340 Kelvin up to 340, almost 344 Kelvin, there are these interesting patterns that come up, okay? And the patterns as they're coming up are, um, fractal in nature. So what you're seeing here is structure on, on all link scales. And of course, when I say fractal, we have a lot of mathematics and data analysis behind that to back up that claim that it's fractal. Um, but you can see it by eye already in some of these images. You can see that there are holes inside and holes inside of those and so forth. And you can see that the boundary is not straight. It's something that's got a lot of structure to it. So this is the type of fractal that has a, a volume fractal dimension. The interior is Swiss cheesy and a whole a fractal dimension, the edges are kind of lacy. And we can, we can get those numbers out of these images. Um, so we, we study, for example, the volume fractal dimension. Again, how is this Swiss cheesy? And we'll get the whole fractal dimension out, which is the, the boundary edge there. Um, and so this is just the, the obligatory plot to show you that there is hardcore data analysis back here behind it. And if you have questions later, you're welcome to, to ask me. But what we compared here um, on, the vertical scale is roughly what's the linear size of this thing? Okay, if I if I say that this is the middle, you know, about how long out until I reach the edge? That's the, that's we have a much more technical way to calculate that, but that's what this is telling you is what's the size linearly of that green object, for example. Zoom in on the green object, and then this would plot for you how many pixels in there are colored green inside of that volume. And when we compare the two on a, this is a log log plot. When we compare the two on a log log plot, we see a nice line, which is evidence of power law behavior. So I'm getting technical, but, um, the power law behavior that's evidenced by the fact that the data are lining up on a straight line is evidence that there's a fractal in there. And then the number we get out of this is the fractal, uh, is one of the fractal dimensions. So this measure gives you the volume fractal dimension. And the, the key thing to notice is that it's going over several orders of magnitude. If you're used to looking at log log plots, this is two or three orders of magnitude that it's going over. Here, this is where we calculate the whole fractal dimension out of the, the data set. So we've extracted the whole fractal dimension as well. And the fact that these data points line up over a long range, um, this is about two decades of scaling, meaning um, two factors of 10 zoom in. So this shows you that over two factors of 10 zoom in, you still seeing the fractal structure. This plot shows you that over three, fract three factors of 10 zoom in, you're seeing a fractal structure. Um, and the only reason it ends is because the data set ends. So we don't actually know how far it goes until larger data sets are acquired, which of course, when you, you say that to your experimental collaborator, they say, do you have any idea how long it took to get this image? Okay, so. Um, so we have conversations going on. Um, and it may be that, you know, different, uh, you know, Yulia asked the extremely important question of link scales. Different probes have different natural link scales over which they operate. They have different uh, resolutions, which think of that as the pixel size, and they have different fields of view that they acquire before basically people get tired of doing the experiment and move on to do something else, or they run out of money for the experiment. It just, it just takes time to get these intricate, beautiful data sets. So probably what may happen is that we will end up eventually chaining together different probes to get the more dynamic range. Uh, we're not there yet, but we'd, we'd love to do that eventually. Um, so that was to convince you that there are fractals in vanadium dioxide, okay? Those are the plots to show you that. And um, so there's scale and, oops, sorry. There are scale invariant fractal clusters. Um, the comparison then, taking those fractal numbers, the fractal numbers actually end up being as good as a fingerprint for helping us know exactly what interactions in the material produce those patterns. So we're excited about that as well, that we can draw conclusions then about the physics causing the patterns based on those fractal numbers. And so some of the, the interesting things that come out of that um, is that we expect, you know, just from the shapes here, we can tell you that this is something where you should be able to increase the disorder and broaden the hysteresis range. You should be able to use the disorder to control. You can use it as a control parameter why, rather than seeing, uh, by disorder here, I mean defects in the material. I should have said that. So every material, no matter how clean and pure you make it originally, 
just due to thermodynamics and it being at a finite temperature, it will get a concentration of defects in it. There's a concentration of defects thermodynamically required. It's, it's entropy. If you've heard of entropy, that's the phenomenon where you open up your closet and it's more disordered than the last time. Same thing happens to materials on the shelf. They get more disordered. So we can tell you then that you can actually use that as a means of control and how to control it. And we can also tell you that if you watch this picture over time, you will see what's called coarsening and, and aging. And so those are some of the um, interesting things that, that come out of these kinds of analysis. I'm going to skip this because I think it's time to end. And so I'll just say that we've done these types of analysis on a few different quantum materials. Um, where the data sets are available at the interesting phase transition. Um, and we've identified fractals um, in, in three of them. We have other experimental collaborators knocking at our door. We're, we're, we've, um, we're, we're busy at work on other materials, but we've identified them in two different metal insulator transition materials as well as a uh, high temperature superconductor. And um, that tells us that there's a universal pattern formation the universal fractal behavior happening at some of these quantum materials at certain electronic phase transitions. And so I'll end there and take any more questions you have. Thanks for your time. Yes. It was a very good talk. Uh, Thank you. So do you, do you expect these uh, continuous phase transitions to, to lead to fractal behavior? Oh yeah. Okay. So, um, so in uh, yeah, that's a great question. We actually um, have a lot. There's a there's a good long history of the theory of phase transitions, and so it's been known for a few decades that at second order phase transitions, certain properties go fractal. Um, that language wasn't really used in the literature. The language they were using was power law scaling, but it's the same thing functionally. Okay, so, um, and uh, most of those phase transitions are such that the fractals are coming in and, existent, in and out of existence so quickly no one could image them. So, for example, I showed you the test tube that went white. That's all, it's liquid, so it's fluctuating in and out of existence. So if you had a really fast probe <laughs> that could take somehow a slice of data in the middle, which is exceedingly hard to do, it would show that fractal behavior, but it's very hard to get. So... Um, so th I think that's why it wasn't evident earlier that you could go in and study those patterns is because the, the, the uh, experimental capabilities weren't there to do it. And so people were actually doing it indirectly out of other measures and kind of indirectly inferring it. So what's really nice about the experimental capabilities nowadays, I'm, I'm a theorist, by the way, I do the math side of things, but, um, but experiments in, in uh, quantum materials have really come, you know, they, they do amazing things now. There are many, many different probes, about um, 17 and counting, different ways that people can go atom by atom on the surface or some other pixel size, um, and scan across the surface and get this really intricate, spatially dependent data. And it's that experimental capability that allowed us to have the images in hand of the fractals. Now, there's another key, which is that the ones I showed you are actually static in time. If they sit there and watch, um, it, depends, well, it depends on their temperature scale, okay? But a, a lot of them are, are just sitting there. And that's... Um, that's due to the particular type of phase transition involved. Other phase transitions that might have fractal behavior in it would have them kind of moving so quickly as it does in the, in the test tube, they were moving so quickly. It's, it's a question of how fast are they fluctuating compared to your, your probe that you can measure with. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of time scales and things to, to disentangle out. Yes, Bill. So you're talking about scanning atom by atom. You get, you get limited at some point by the uncertainty principle that you're scanning? Um, yes, okay, so, so of course I don't, I don't do the scans, but um, uh, yes, the uncertainty principle uh, matters. Believe it or not, though, so STM, scanning tunneling microscopy, this is where you take a, a tip and scan it across the sample, or more, usually people hold the tip and they scan the sample, it's more practical that way, but they can go atom by atom, they can actually get subatomic resolution. So not quite down to a tenth of the size of an atom, but maybe a quarter the size of an atom. It just blows my mind. We live in a very technologically advanced society. At that point, uncertainty principle kicks in? Uh, well, at that point, you're, you're really looking at the, the shape of, you know, the standing wave that the electron makes. So, um, 
you know, yes, the uncertainty principle kicks in, but it's not hindering your ability to see that structure. There is structure there. Um, and so, in fact, when you're seeing those data points, you, here's how you get, here's how you can get over the uncertainty principle there. Um, yes, any given, um, if you think, what scanning tunneling microscopy does is it either, it sets a voltage between the tip and the sample, and then electrons jump from the sample, I'm sorry, from the tip into the sample, or you can run it the other way and suck electrons out of the sample and into the tip. And so that electron by electron process is very much subject to the uncertainty principle. So what people do is they sit there and take data for a while. So they sit there for about a second and take data, over which time so many electrons have gone by that they can time average and get around that uncertainty principle to get more certainty there. In the same way that, so the uncertainty principle basically tells us that on any given quantum measurement, we have big error bars. That's one way to think of it, okay? So on any given quantum measurement, we might measure this, but we'd measure something slightly different the next time and so forth. So a way around that is to just repeat it many, many times. In the same way as if I give you a pair of dice and you don't know what you're going to get on any roll of the dice, but if you roll the dice enough times, you know how often you're going to get double sixes. You know how often you're going to get snake eyes. This is how casinos make money, right? Um, so when you do it enough times, it'll average out, and you can beat, in a sense, you can beat it. And so that's how they do it. Does that kind of help? Yeah, yeah. There was a question back here. Hi, I have a question about fractalness. Yes. So in your initial example video, you essentially had a perfect fractal that was exactly the same image as you zoomed in. Right. Right? But real materials aren't going to be perfect images. Right. Be messy. Absolutely. What criteria do you use to judge how fractal we the material is? And do you have a clear criteria on, on labeling something as fractal or not fractal? Okay, uh, great question. So yes, there's a major difference between the first fractals that I showed you, which are mathematical objects, and there's no disorder in them. Um, and then the data sets that I showed you. There's definitely randomness in the data sets on top of it. And so um, in, in some sense, you can do this averaging process that I mentioned. So we do actually depend on, um, we do depend on having enough pixels in the image to where we can do the analysis. So we're looking for certain features. We wanna see, you know, we're looking, looking for, we need an image that's at least 200 pixels by 200 pixels. Then we have what we call dynamic range. There's a, there's a couple of factors of 10 in there, right? From the single, fact, single pixel, 10 times larger is 10 pixels, 10 times larger is 100 pixels. Okay, so 200 pixels is, a, is about that. We need about that much in there to run the kind of analyses that I was showing you. And that helps um, average over the randomness in a way that we can then get the information out. But we're told we're up against this a lot. And so we're all always running simulations that say, okay, for your size data set, maybe you didn't quite get 200 by 200 pixels. Like I have a collaborator at MIT right now. He, he's able to get, you know, 70 by 70 pixels. It's really pushing the limits. So then we have to go back and run simulations on those kind of sizes so that we can say, look, in different instances of that, here's the range that you could expect. And then, you know, you may find that the range is so big, it's hard to draw conclusions. So we're up against these things a lot. Now, one of the things that we've done to try to overcome it is to apply, you guessed it, machine learning. So <laughs> we, we have, um, we, we just put out a paper on that for physical review materials. And so, um, and it's not that hard to get into machine learning nowadays. The, there are some canned, um, uh, little things that come in MATLAB. So in fact, that's, you know, the, I had a couple of brilliant students who were very interested in this and that's, that's what they did. They used the tools that are available in MATLAB. But here's what's cool. Whereas we need, like, you know, a certain number of pixels to draw the conclusions by the methods I said, when we trained, um, a neural network, it could have smaller data sets. So we're very excited about that. It could, it could, uh, draw some conclusions based on smaller data sets. We need both methods because the, Neural networks are a black box. We don't really know what they're doing. They just give you answers. I don't know. How did it come up with that? I don't know. I'm a neural network. Okay. So, um, so we use them in conjunction. Yeah. I hope that helped. And you had a question, Patrick. Yeah. Eric, I just wondered, um, you sort of focused a lot of the talk on explaining the objects you were studying, but you've got a list of implications on the last slide. I know it's a bit of jargon on there, but mm. is there any chance you could take us through the implications in non-technical language? Um, uh, 
Yes. Um, so the uh, okay. So the fractal clusters we got right. So that's that's the shapes. Um, the uh, the glassiness actually comes from having identified the actual model that's giving rise to these shapes. And so um, that's actually a pretty long discussion. Uh, let me see how much I can distill that. Um, yes, OK, so I'm going to distill that really quickly. Um, these second order phase transitions do have a fluctuation time scale. So you saw in the test tube, you could you remember that fluctuate. There was a time scale of those fluctuations. It's actually interesting. I like showing that one because it's it's on human time scales. You can see it happening, OK? Um, and then there's a, a particular time scale to equilibration when you're at that point. And it turns out, because the fluctuations are going across the entire sample, and you saw that it took time for that fluctuation to go across, even in the test tubes, it took like a second, OK? Um, that actually tells you that there's long time scales to equilibration. When you get right to these critical points, um, you have to wait longer and longer for the system to come to thermal equilibrium. So that's why this is here. Um, glassiness and aging is that phenomenon that because there are correlated fluctuations across the sample, those take time to propagate. That propagation time is your, your bound on how long you have to wait for things to thermalize, to come to equilibration. That depends if you're trying to use the material yeah. for some technological application that presumably has implications. Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, and I didn't really tell you what we mean by, by glass, you know, the, what, what we mean technically by glass is not just the window glass, but the fact that it actually fell out of equilibrium, right? So the window glass is silicon dioxide. Well, that's not its equilibrium state. The equilibrium state of silicon dioxide at room temperature is quartz. Anybody have a quartz crystal? I love minerals, so I have lots of quartz crystals lying around the house and in my office. You just never know when you're going to need one, right? But that's its equilibrium configuration. And the window glass happened to be glass rather than quartz. Quartz is the crystalline structure. That's the disordered glassy structure. But it's stuck. We could wait a long time. It's not going to turn into quartz. Um, and so that's an example where the equilibration time scale went off the charts. That's how we get window glass. And so that's what I mean here. When you see these kind of patterns, we know there are long time scales to equilibration. And so you should expect the glassy behavior of it'll take a while, take a long time to equilibrate. A consequence of that is the hysteresis. This is part of why if you move too quickly, you'll miss things. And a consequence of that is non-repeatability. I put this up here to, <laughs> I'm trying to uh, educate my colleagues about this. There are places where we, we uh, as, a, as a community of scientists, we try to draw phase diagrams. And we like to have a nice, neat phase diagram that says, when I go to this temperature and pressure, the material does this. Or when I go to this temperature and pressure, it does this. And people only ever draw one color. When you have hysteresis and glassiness and aging, that's not going to happen. You could get to the same temperature and pressure and have a totally different phase in these kind of materials. So we remind people there's an element of non-repeatability unless you're very careful with your hysteresis protocols. And you very, you, so it means that, you know, what we're trying to remind our colleagues to do is to be sure and, and tell us exactly the history this material's been through. You know, was it at room temperature? Did you anneal it, you know, at a higher temperature? If so, for how long? Did you, when you thermally cycled it, how far up did you go? All this stuff is going to matter as far as do you come back to the same state or not. So that's the non-repeatability. I'm really glad you asked that. Thank you. I did not pay him to ask that question. So, yeah. yeah. Other questions? Yes, please. I have a couple of questions. So the first one is, uh, when you talk about the fraction, fractal nature of this phase transition, is it the same for different materials, like the fractal dimensions, etc., or is it uh, different for vanadium dioxide versus you know, yeah, so in fact, um, there are, um, yeah, I did, I did use the word universal. It turns out, um, and it's not terribly surprising, these two materials have the same fractal numbers. So they're, they're different materials, they're, they're undergoing a similar transition, though. This is what's, what's interesting about these phase transitions, is that when you know the character of the phase transition, the fractals that come out of it are universal, and it, the, the microscopics don't matter. So this is a metal insulator transition happening in a real material that has some material disorder in it. That's actually key as well. 
If there were no disorder, the patterns would look different. They'd have a different signature to them. But they both have the same fractal numbers. And those fractal numbers can be traced back to, again, what kind of uh, transition you have. Is disorder present or not? And the dimension of the system. So both of these are thin films. So their dimension is two, all right? Um, this one was pretty cool. This is, um, this is, uh, uh, scanning tunneling microscopy data on a different material. It's what we're tracking here is those stripe orientations. And I didn't show you the analysis of this. We published this. That's this paper here in Nature Communications 2012. Um, we were able to identify from the fractal numbers on the surface. It's just a surface measurement. We know that fract goes, goes all the way through. Okay, because the fractal numbers change, change depending on the dimension of the physics involved. In the same way that when you look out there and you see fractals, even though you're seeing a two-dimensional view, you know it's filling space. And you could tell the difference between those fractals out there in the trees that fill space and frost that grows on the window that you could identify as a two-dimensional phenomenon. So, yeah, thank you for asking. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Now I open a can of worms. Yeah, that's great. We'll be here all night. So, so uh, is this fractal nature related to the second law of thermodynamics, or uh, can I not relate thermodynamics because you say it's non repeatable Oh. Well, okay. So we talk about equilibrium thermodynamics and non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Um, and so, you know, uh, I have said there's some non-equilibrium aspects here because it will take you a while to equilibrate. And the second law of thermodynamics is always in operation, so we don't, we don't get to get around it. Um, so in a sense, yes, it's involved. Um, my question, okay, so let me rephrase my okay. So can I say that the fractal nature, that, that the thing that, that uh, you observe a fractal nature of the phase transition, right. because let's say there is something like a principle of least action act. Okay, um, so the, the principle of least action, okay, so you're talking about minimizing your thermodynamic potential. Okay, fine. So, um, uh, anybody have a whiteboard? Okay, um, so, so that's, uh, so yes, these are at finite temperature, and therefore you have to be using the right thermodynamic function in describing things. And that always depends on exactly which experiment you're doing. Like, you know, chemists like to work with enthalpy. I've never understood enthalpy, although I can write it down. So, uh, you know, physicists like to work in terms of a Helmholtz free energy, but each of these is gonna be, tell me your experiment. Is your experiment controlling temperature? Is it controlling pressure or volume? Like whether it controls pressure or volume, you use a different thermodynamic function, right? And so, um, so that tells you which one you should use. We're working, um, you know, we're always working in, in terms of um, uh, the thermodynamic function that's appropriate to the, the material. And yes, because they're at finite temperature, you got, you got entropy, so you've always got the second law of thermodynamics. Yeah, you're making me want to write down a bunch of math, but I'm going to refrain. <laughs> All right, another question from uh, Professor Pushkar. I have a quantum question. Oh, great. So, when are we going to change couple wires to quantum materials? Oh, I would love that. I uh, yeah, I know this is great. So, uh, I've done a lot of work on superconductors on on what we call high temperature superconductors because they're so much higher than the previous class of materials we knew. So, you know, uh, scientists work in terms of the Kelvin scale. Room temperature is about 300 Kelvin. We like to work in terms of Kelvin because then you know what zero means. Zero Kelvin is no temperature. There's no thermal fluctuations at all. It's the very bottom. You can't go below that. Okay. So the first superconductors that were discovered work around four Kelvin. Not very exciting. Okay. Cause you're not going to be able to apply them very easily. The high temperature superconductors work around a hundred Kelvin. That's still not room temperature, but it's so much higher. We call it high temperature as though they're warm or something like that. But it's not that bad. You can use liquid nitrogen to cool them. And liquid nitrogen is about as expensive as milk, so it's not, it's not unheard of. And there are a lot of places where they're already applied. So high temperature superconductors are already applied in, um, cell phone towers. There are some, you know, power grids in major cities that have replaced their copper wires with high temperature superconductors. But again, the nice thing about a superconductor, what's super about it is it doesn't lose any energy. If you, um, were to, 
you know, feel this wire, you probably can't quite tell. It's a little bit warm. If you put on IR glasses, though, infrared glasses show you heat, you would see that the wire's glowing in the infrared. Why is it glowing? It's because it's losing energy, right? So electrical wires that we use, typically copper, metal, to carry electricity, they're leaky pipelines, right? So can you imagine if, you know, in going from the power company to where you're using the power, it's been a leaky pipeline the whole way. You're paying for all this power you didn't even get. You would not put up with this with the water company or the natural gas company, but we're stuck with it with the power company. So if we could convert to superconductors, we'd go a long way towards solving the energy crisis. So your, your question is how long? Nobody knows. Um, I wish I knew, right? I wish we had solved it 10 years ago, but there's a worldwide effort to discover new materials. What's, what's, what's hard, makes it hard to predict is that we don't understand everything about the problem. So because we don't understand everything theoretically about the problem, then there's a little bit of bushwhacking, right? which requires people to create new materials and then we measure them, create new materials and we measure them. So um, in a discovery chain like that, it's impossible to say, we'll have it in 10 years. It could come tomorrow or it could come in 50 years, but I really hope it's closer to tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, question here. Uh, have you ever imaged uh, like magnetic current and uh, transitions? Um, I didn't quite understand the question. I, I can't quite hear. Transition in magnetic properties of materials, like a magnet being non-magnetic. Oh, and and what these what they look like there? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. So ferromagnets have some other physics in them that tends to give them a different structure. So uh, an actual ferromagnet tends to to form domains. Actually, they don't they don't quite go fractal in most of those. They the domain structure uh, is kind of like if you if you were to find like a lodestone out in nature, it's probably just got a lot of different domains and it. it's not all magnetized. Um, and part of that's coming from the fact when when you when the material originally cooled, the fact that a, a little magnetic domain forms, which then puts out a magnetic field. And that magnetic field comes out the North Pole and back into the South Pole. So over here, where the magnetic field's pointing down, when that region cools, it tends to magnetize in the opposite direction. So the thing that happens with magnets, meaning ferromagnets, like refrigerator magnets, is that those long range interactions drive you into a different limit and you just get the domains that you're used to. And so then you might wonder, how does anyone ever get a magnet? You get a, a permanent magnet by raising the temperature of the material so all the magnetism goes away. And then you apply a big magnetic field on the whole thing and you let it cool inside that magnetic field, which causes all the domains to line up at the same direction. And then you take off that magnetic field. That's how you get your commercial permanent magnets. So we can never image the transition where oh. domain forms, wider domains. Oh no, we can image them. This is yeah, yeah, no, no. They 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 they've been imaged. They just don't go fractal because of, of those long range. Pardon? Do they still show practice within a single domain? No. Oh, within a single, no, no, a single domain has a single a magnetization. It's a, there's the long range physics actually of that, of those, um, magnetic fields influencing how the other domains form. That's a very long range interaction. It falls off like one over R cubed. And so because of that long range nature of it, um, it ends up giving you different patterns that actually aren't fractal. Kind of makes me sad, but there we go. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I can have fractals everywhere. Yeah. Maybe one more. I have a very basic question about your initial slide on fractal itself. Uh huh. Uh, so, is it either or hull or volume fractal, or can you see both? Oh, great question. You can see both at the same time, and in fact, you're seeing both here. So, this is an example where there's an interior fractal dimension, and there's a, an edge or a hull fractal dimension. So, you actually you're actually seeing it here. Yeah, great question. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>